evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Isaac Bronco, and you're joining us for our third uh, webinar in the series this spring uh, over local meats marketing. And our topic tonight is finding your niche market and navigating farmers markets. Uh, we have a good group of panelists tonight with uh, Simone Y from the Red River Market Farmers Market, uh, Ashley Bruner from Dakota Angus. Kelsey Crap from the Bison Ranch, and or Crop from the Bison Ranch, and then also uh, Ron and Beth Wolf will be joining us again from uh, last week uh, from Wolf Suffix. Um, I mean, it's always a good time to differentiate yourself from other producers, and uh, we'll start off tonight with uh, some remarks from Simone Y um, as she talks about her experience with Red River Market and working with producers. Um, Go ahead and turn it over to you, Simone. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Simone Y, uh, like Isaac said, and I am part of the Red River Market in Fargo, North Dakota. We founded the market in uh, 2015. So this summer, we'll, this summer and fall, we'll start our eighth season at the market. Um, and I uh, run our team of eight uh, staff and interns uh, during the summer and fall. Um, and I'm the director of marketing and programming. So. Um, I'm the one that uh, helps get over 100,000 visitors to the market um, every summer with um, all the press that we do, all the advertising that we do. Um, we have an awesome following on social media uh, that we take advantage of. Um, and it's really, really grown over the years, which we are extremely proud of. Um, so along with the about 80 vendors uh, that usually are there every weekend, we'll span um, that will span over uh, three blocks of downtown Fargo. Um, we have four daily performances, which includes live music, cultural performances, um, dance, theater, all kinds of different things. Uh, we also have a cooking demo every Saturday uh, that features fresh produce from our uh, produce vendors and uh, meat vendors. And then we have tons of children's programming. Um, we do special events for uh, kids and families at the market um, and really uh, contributes to the community vibe that we have going at the market. Like I said, over 17 weekends, we'll see um, over 100,000 people over across across those events. Um, we've actually already had 115 vendors apply uh, for the market. So we're seeing great growth and I'm very excited to say that we are seeing growth in produce and meat vendors at the market. Uh, I know there's always a fear that uh, people aren't starting new farms or, or businesses of that type, um, but they are coming out of the woodwork and, and people are actually, not only are they coming to our market, but they are starting um, those businesses from scratch, which we're very excited about. Uh, when we started the market, we uh, really started small with a goal of being one of the best markets in the country after 10 years. Uh, we still have um, three more seasons to re or two more seasons before we reach our 10th season. <laughs> um, and I think we're doing really well. We've been featured. Um, we had our picture in the New York Times. Um, I've spoken at a conference with the National Farmers Market Association. Um, so I don't know what necessarily um, what has to happen before uh, we know we're in uh, one of the top, but I feel like we're, we're well on our way there, which is really exciting. Uh, we like to say that we're more than just a market. Uh, we know people spend more money when they stay at the market longer. So we really focus on elements that get people um, hanging out for half an hour, an hour, two hours, more than they'd ever stay at a grocery store. Um, so we focus on elements like hot food, coffee, live music, drinks, and uh, seating all in a really welcoming space and that get people to do that so that they spend more money with our amazing vendors. Uh, we actually just last season made a huge milestone. Uh, we topped $1 million in revenue for our vendors across a single season, um, which is pretty incredible um, in my opinion. Um, I just wanted to give a few bullet points on um, what I've seen makes a successful vendor at the market. Um, and I think successful vendors really have a clear and simple message uh, to market visitors about what they provide. Um, and it's really helpful to be known for something at the market. Uh, vendors that have a single item that um, they really advertise and becomes popular, um, helps that vendor be, you know, the hand pie vendor or, um, you know, whatever it is. Um, over our 
winter markets, um, Brown's Ranch actually just made like a new meat stick display um, where you could actually see the products, see all the flavors that they had. And I feel like just in expanding that um, space in their booth made them the meat stick vendor. Um, so people go back to get that one single item. Um, especially with meat vendors, it can be hard to display products. Um, and, and so you'll have to rely on signage um, to have a clear and consistent message of what you sell. I think the best performing vendors at the market have samples and they are constantly finding different ways to interact with their customers and educate them. Um, I was just talking to a couple of uh, the vendors at our market um, this last weekend. We had our last spring event. Um, and they were saying uh, being part of a market is more than just about um, making one single sale with a customer. It's about building a long-term relationship with that customer. Um, so you really have to invest in that relationship so that they're able to invest in you. Well, that's great. Uh, thank you for uh, that insight. Um, it's good to have you, um, especially since uh, you do a lot of managing of the farmer's market. And um, it's good to get that insight from someone from that uh, oversight. Uh, all right, uh, we'll move on to uh, Ashley Bruner um, from the Dakota Angus uh, Company or Ranch. Um, and I'll turn it over to you and you get your slides up. Okay, super. All right. Well, first of all, I just want to thank you, Isaac, for coordinating all of this. Um, I think the first two weeks that I've watched have been great. A lot of really valuable information. Um, as mentioned, I'm Ashley Bruner and I'm with Dakota Angus LLC. Um, Dakota Angus is a partnership between Bruner Angus Ranch of Drake, um, North Dakota, which is North Central North Dakota, and Wendell Livestock near Lemoore, which is southeastern part of the state. Um, I, I guess the idea of what is now Dakota Angus started a few years ago already. It seems like it was just yesterday, but it's it's been a few years now. Um, Really, it came down to, you know, the volatility in the market and wanting to have more control over what we're getting for our fed cattle. Um, Bruner Angus Ranch and Wendell Livestock are both registered seed stock um, Black Angus producers. And so uh, we both have annual production sales where we sell uh, Black Angus bulls and uh, replacement females to our customers. And so that's our primary operations on both ends. Um, but it, it really came down to what can we do? Um, you know, we work hard every day for our production side of things, but uh, what can we do to take more control over what we're getting paid for our hard work? And so um, the idea of selling beef retail, it transpired from that. On both sides, we had already been doing some, you know, quarters, halves, and holes for family and friends, um, things like that. But we really just decided that, you know, let's let's try and do this on a bigger scale. And of course, initially the idea was, let's build a processing plant and let's do everything from start to finish. And then we, you know, realize that that's a, that's a big, a big investment and a big deal. So let's pump the brakes a little bit and let, let's take a step back and see, you know, how can we really get started in the retail beef um, locally sourced market here in North Dakota? And we found a, um, a great partner at a federally inspected facility. Uh, of course, that allows us to do uh, what we're doing, selling beef retail by the, by the cut. Um, I think initially we thought that we were going to just continue to sell quarters, halves, and holes like we had been, um, but that's not really what's happened. Um, I think uh, all of the partners involved have been kind of shocked that uh, we're definitely doing more retail by the cut because our customers are really liking the opportunity to just come to us and say, you know, I want a couple of sirloins and strips and ribeyes, and I want a couple of roasts, and I want 20 pounds of hamburger, and then they're out the door. Um, and so we've learned a lot over the last couple of years. We, we actually started uh, retailing as Dakota Angus in April of 2022. So just over a year now, um, we've been Dakota Angus. And our customers shopping options include online. We have a website. Um, they can book quarter tabs and holes online. They can fill out a retail order form. Um, when they fill out a retail order form, they can choose their option of either picking it up from our in-store location here near Drake um, they can have it delivered to one of our delivery options. We kind of have a few different places that we go to for deliveries, um, but they can also have it shipped. We do ship to 48 states. Um, and so um, they, they do have a few options there. As mentioned, we do have a, a location here at our place just north of Drake. We have a 12 by 16 walk-in freezer and 
and all of our shelves are are lined and labeled by cut and by quality grade because we do quality grade our carcasses. Um, so we have the in-store option, but then farmer's markets. So initially, I don't think that farmer's markets were really on our radar, um, but towards the end of last summer, we actually landed this really, I'll call it cute, a uh, little freezer truck. And it's just a little, little Chevy truck with a freezer box on the back and I can drive it. And so we just thought, what the heck, you know, there's farmer's markets kicking off right now and let's go do them and, and see how they go. And it actually became a pretty fun little endeavor for me and my oldest daughter. Um, she ventured out to several of them with me. She's nine and, um, you know, kids and technology, she was able to run the invoice device just fine. She's learned her cuts of meat faster than I have <laughs> as an adult. And so, I mean, she knows where the cuts are in the truck and she's, you know, running around grabbing burger patties or pounds of burger and steaks out of the truck and filling orders for customers. And so it really became something fun and kind of a little family adventure for us. Um, but farmer's markets were more than that. And and um, like Simone was saying, you build relationships. Um, I'm huge on um, customer education, consumer education, right? Especially with what we're doing with you know, farm to table and, and locally source and things like that. There's a whole it's like a whole new world sometime, even though we're in rural North Dakota, there, there really is a lot of consumer educating to do when it comes to locally sourcing, you know, any product, right? And so I've really enjoyed the time spent at the farmer's markets that we've done, um, just meeting with customers, letting them know who we are, you know, who our family is, what we're doing, you know, where the beef comes from. And it, it's been you know, comments like people would walk up to my table and to the back of the truck and say, can I really buy a steak from you right here, right now? Like, it's just a whole new world for some people to see that. And, and it, it's just been really fun. And I really appreciate that we have farmer's markets as the option, because I think when it comes to locally sourced, like that's where, that's where it started, right? As, as farmer's markets. And so um, a great option, but when you're deciding, you know, what option is best for you? Um, if, if you're just getting started in, you know, locally sourcing your, your products or, or, or wherever you're at with it, I think that this, this graphic here, the four P's can be very helpful. And so, um, first of all, what's your product? Um, you know, like Simone mentioned, if you're at a farmer's market, you kind of want to really hone in on what your product is. You don't want to have, you know, 500 different products because then people get overwhelmed. There's a lot of vendors already to begin with. And so if you can be, you know, more specific in what your product is. For us, we are very specifically quality Angus beef. As Black Angus seed stock producers, it's important that the product that we carry is an Angus beef product. And now we have multiple cuts available, but we are strictly Angus beef in our operation. Um, and, and in addition to kind of define the niche that, that we are providing, um, I, I think I briefly touched on it, we quality grade our carcasses. And so when our carcasses are hanging at the um, at the processor, a USDA um, grader comes in and grades each carcass. And so we're able to tell our customers if it's a uh, select choice certified Angus beef or prime. And, and that's something that is really unique, um, especially here right now, um, because I'm not sure that there's anybody else in the state that is having their beef carcasses quality graded. And so people really are able to choose the quality from us. Um, in addition to, to the grading, we are a licensed retailer with the Certified Angus Beef Organization, and that really sets us apart. Um, right now, we're one of only three uh, ranch to table operations that can say that. They just started a pilot program in the last year, and uh, we were fortunate enough to be chosen as one of their pilot projects. And so um, we do carry Certified Angus Beef branded products. So, so we, are, we are definitely very specific in our product. Um, so then the people, you know, define, think about and define who it is that you want to market to. What, what is your um, ideal customer? Who is it that you, you want to want your product, right? And so there's definitely, um, when it comes to beef, a, a range of people that you can, can sell to if it's, you know, um, the mom of the house who's doing all the grocery shopping or what's unique for us is that we found in a lot of households it's the man of the house is doing the beef shopping because he's the one putting it on the smoker or or whatever the case may be or, or doing the meat cooking. And so um, tying in with with people, I'm going to move forward to price as well. 
So um, be conscious of price. I guess I'm conscious of price. Um, we've got the local grocery store. Uh, we've got the, the bigger supermarkets. You've got the Walmarts and the Costcos. And anytime I'm shopping, I'm looking at the meat counter to, to see where their pricing is compared to our pricing. Because I certainly don't want to be outpricing our product to where even though a customer might want a high quality Angus steak, there's still a balance of how much a customer is willing to pay for that, even though it's locally sourced and they know the quality they're going to get versus, you know, what they might still be able to pay at, at the grocery store. So be conscious of your price, um, but but definitely define that. I think in the beginning, I had the piece of advice from somebody that said, don't let a customer um, mess with your pricing. And it, it wasn't said like that, but those are the words that are coming to my mind right now. But basically saying, you know, you work hard to produce the product that you have. So don't undercut yourself. Um, but also just be conscious to not overprice yourself as well. And then place. Um, you know, I shared the the three different options of where we are available. Um, it can get to be a lot. You know, um, there was definitely towards the end of farmer's market season last fall where I was getting to be burnt out a little bit because it, it it can be a lot depending on how many you do. And I know, Ron and Beth, Beth I think you guys said last week you only do the one market. Super smart. <laughs> I was running around last fall doing like three, four, five in a week. Um, but we were also in the mode of just getting our, our name and our brand out there. And, and it really was fun, but definitely define your place and, and where you want to see your product and, and what you want to put into the place and, and where you're, you're sharing your product. Um, so again, we're, we're online, um, we're active on social, Facebook and Instagram. I've taken many orders via text message. In fact, I just got an order fulfilled before we jumped on here, a text message from a customer saying, hey, I see you're coming to this town next week. Can you get me this, this, and this? And, and um, that works works pretty slick for, for me and my customers. So um, hopefully those are just a, a few pieces of information that would, would help when kind of defining some of those things for you. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, that's a... I mean, everybody can always appreciate quality beef. I, mean, I grew up on a cattle ranch, so it's good to see that there's people out there still doing it. Um, now, moving on, we'll we'll go back to Ron and Beth uh, Wolf from last week, um, and they they talked a little bit about their farmers market experience last uh, webinar. Yeah, thanks, Isaac, for allowing us and inviting us to be at this one, and. You know, as we went through the introduction, I'm not going to go through the whole thing again because apparently we do have, you know, repeat people. But, you know, when we got into this, and I'll just say it, you know, like Ashley, they're in the seed stock business and so are we. But uh, they are they don't all make that. They don't, they're not all breeding stock. And so this was our option. And actually it was Beth's idea to try something like that uh, back then. And, and from a marketing standpoint, when we talked about the numbers we had available and and uh, you know we are a seasonal, we are seasonal sellers basically, just because we're winter lammers, and the way we're set up and the way our my job is and stuff like that, um, we lamb in the winter time, and uh, we set ourselves up basically for having fat lambs through early summer into fall. And um, when we first did this, and I'm going to transition this over to Beth because it was kind of her brainchild. And uh, she does visit a lot with Simone. And, and as we said last week, this is our first, this was our first in choice when uh, we looked into this. And I think at that time, the Red River Market was a couple of years old. And we've done this, what, this going to be our sixth year or seven? Six. Uh, so the success lies, you know, with making a relationship with them and being, you know, successful enough that every year when we apply, we do get invited back. So apparently we're doing some right things with them. And, and as Simone uh, alluded to, one of the reasons why we do go there is the amount of people that come through. And it's an event, uh, you know, and, and we only go twice a month, mainly because um, we have a life. We, we try <laughs> to have a life, uh, you know, other than and it's a it's a full day. And and like you said, Ashley, uh, you can get it burn you out if you and how those people do it week after week. And I know they probably rely on that more as their income or whatever. And, and this is an important thing for us. Don't get me wrong. But uh, the exposure that we get there and, and the growth, this is, I think, probably where it's at now uh, is the most successful. They've moved. This is the third move. But with the 
with the Broadway Square and stuff like that and the stage and everything like this, uh, you know, there's no doubt. And I tell people that we probably get exposed to seven to 9,000 people on a nice day. Uh, it's amazing. And, and the setup is great. Um, I'm going to let Beth talk a little, and I'm sure I have an opinion, but I'll let her, you know, talk about what we do and how, why we do it. Okay. Well, as Ron said, you know, we are at the Red River Market, and when I approached our family about doing this, it was important to me to find a really good market that was going to, like, have a following. And I really feel that that's what we found at the Red River Market. Um, we're pleased with how it's run. And granted, I don't have much to compare it to except the ones that I go to as a customer. From a vendor point of view, it's top notch. You can't tell their interns from their everyday staff. That's, I mean, that's just how well that, that they run the farmer's market there. And kudos to you, Simone, because I know you've been there since the beginning and you've done a great job with it. Um, probably, I would say 80% of our customers are repeat customers. So that's huge as far as the relationships. You know, they come up to us and I'm not good with names, but I know faces. And I can see them coming and beelining and it's like, okay, they're gonna, you know, they're gonna want chops or they're gonna want uh, lamb sticks or I just know what they're going to want. And sometimes they have to tell us all about what has happened from the last Saturday in October until the first Saturday in July. And that's, that's part of the job is to listen to their stories because they're willing to listen to, to us tell our stories about our meat. And um, we do, as Travis alluded to before we started, we do wear bright red. We have a red canopy and that is all on purpose. That is part of the marketing um, that we use so that people know that we're Wolf Suffolk's. And, and that goes with consistency then, you know, where people look for that and whether, you know, it might be a daughter in there or something like that, but uh, we do it on purpose. Yes. Um, let me think. I just lost my train of thought. We bring our meat in coolers. And so we should be expecting a visit from our, our health guy any week now, I'm assuming. He, the, he's pretty good about, I don't know, you know, it's an unannounced visit, but he'll be showing up and, and he will in inspect our freezers. And then he'll also look at our coolers. And, you know, we might throw a few packages of meat in there and a bag of ice and a thermometer and we'll visit and visit and visit. And then at the end of the end of our um, visit, he'll go back and check that to make sure that it, you know, it held the temperature that he wants it at. And so that's that's important to make sure that if, if you're selling out of a cooler, which is what we do, is that you have thermometers in your coolers and that you have. Um, a way to keep your product frozen because some of those Saturday mornings or Saturday afternoons are going to get hot. So you're going to want to make sure that you've got ice and everything else you need to keep your product frozen. I've tried to convince Ron to get a little trailer to pull behind my car. He has not jumped on board yet, but I've also been able to convince of a meat sticks and brought. So, you know, maybe sometime down the line, I'll be able to do the little trailer. Uh, what do you have anything? Well, else? I do. I and I'll jump in here a little bit. And seeing as how we are seasonal with our product, and and we do sell halves and holes. And um, but when we get to the end of the farmers market, we typically plan everything we do around the Red River Market schedule. When they are done for us, and we don't attend their winter any of their winter events, and I apologize, but it just doesn't work out for us because we don't know where we're at with product. But our goal is always at the end of October, be pretty low on inventory. And I know that some of our retail, our couple restaurants aren't real pleased about that, but inventory is expensive and it's not always consistent. But one thing we notice when we go to farmer's market and over the years is that seasonally we change our products a little. It's the same lamb product, but for us, we, um, we figure that 
summertime's grilling season. And so we take our lamb legs, of lamb and our shoulder roasts and a lot of those and make them into steaks. Uh, cause people spend most of their time cooking that out on the grill. And so that's more marketable for us and the roast and that stuff like that. We start, start transitioning into that after Labor Day. And I call that comfort food because then we, you know, people are more you know, on a Sunday afternoon or wherever doing crock pots and stuff like that. And what we found in a, not only that, but it's amazing when they come up to us and, and we've started offering, and I don't know why, but there's people that look for specifically for liver and kidneys and hearts and we sell dog bones. And so we use every part of that, but if they ask for it, there must be a want and a need. And, and so we begin to, you know, bring all of that. And it's amazing how some weeks for us, everybody wants a shank. And then the next week we couldn't give a shank away and, and, you know, but we have that and, and we try to listen to our customers and us being not there every week. One thing we find important is we have a schedule and that's what they kind of like us ahead of time to schedule the days we're there. Cause you know, if we're not going to be there, somebody will. Simone alluded to that. They only have so many spots and we let our customers know so they can plan accordingly. And so, so the flexibility, we try to be flexible with our customers to, uh, uh, you know, be more successful, I guess. So what we try and do is we try and, you know, make sure that we schedule ahead of time. And then in our, our one of our displays, we have a printout of the dates that will be there. And then we give that to our customers so that they know, okay, they're going to be back on such and such a date. Um, we also get a lot of, of promotional material from the American Lamb Board. And so it's recipe bo booklets and sometimes we've gotten seasonings and I have to pay $2, a little tin container, and I charge $2 for that little tin container. I'm not there to make a profit on the American Lamb Board, but I want to, some people are like, I don't know how to cook it. It's super easy. Here's some spices that are already pre-mixed. You know, it's only going to cost you $2 because that's what it cost me. Um, all of the booklets I give for free. I try and make sure that I have things for kids because if you can draw the kids in, you're going to be able to start the conversation with mom and dad. On our um, priceless board, we have pictures of our family. We have pictures of us showing sheep. We have pictures of, of our winning sheep. Um, we have pictures of lambs. They're so cute. People want to see that, you know, some people have a hard time equating that cute little lamb with that lamb chop they're just buying, but that's where our meat comes from. And I think that it's okay for the consumers to see that. We do have one little guy a couple of years ago, he brought his own money and he said, I just want to try these lamb sticks. He comes back at least three times a season and he's got a $20 bill and he's going to buy four packages and he's not going to share them. <laughs> It's it, those, those are the kinds of, of moments that we look forward to. And I'm, I'm proud to say for, for Ron, you know, we talked about it a little bit last week that we, we have been able to cut out the, the middleman as far as taking lambs to the livestock market. You know, we can, we can set the price on everything that leaves our place, whether it's a seed stock or whether it's a meat cut we are able to set the price up for everything that leaves our place. And I'm, I'm very proud of that. And Amy and I'll allude to that. We find out also, we try to make our product affordable because yes, lamb is a, is a higher price and we don't have the volume of meat, you know, that a beef carcass does. So we need, you know, to have a price that eludes that or gets to that point. But I do, and not that lamb is available all the time at a lot of different, uh, stores but i compare and and you know we don't want to gouge people because i think people only have so much money to spend but if they're coming to look for lamb we want it to be affordable and uh so they'll take some home rather than the price turning them off uh of the experience before they even get a chance to try it and and with that i think you know getting back if you find a farmer's market that's successful I'll be honest with you, we have not looked for another one. 
Um, we have no plans. To. We have no plans to. I know there's ones closer, but like I said, when you get the exposure that we of people, and they're not all shop. I mean, they aren't all buyers of our product. There's no doubt about it. But if we get a percentage, and of course, Mother Nature, when you go in that late in the season, there's been a couple of them that I'll just say that even a butt warmer ain't gonna do it for you. But there's hardy souls if they know you're coming. They might not be there for the all day event, but they might specifically bring their cart to you. And, and, but you know, we live and die by the mother nature when it's nice and sunny out, those people are coming. And, uh, even when it's rainy or something, I will say there's enough going on, Simone, people are out and about, uh, they might change their attire and it, it's interesting to watch. Uh, if nothing else, if things aren't going well, there's a wide variety of things to see. And I'll say that. So I enjoy that. But uh, yeah, and find yourself a farmer's market and a relationship and that is well run by good people. And it makes a difference of what you do. Awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah, no, that's, that's great to hear. And you, I, I, I mean, I visited your guys at the booth personally myself um, last summer. Um, we'll move on to our final panelist for the evening, uh, Kelsey Crop. Uh, with the bison ranch so uh diverging a little bit from uh, to a different species even here yeah thank you uh just a second while i get this slideshow set up if i can figure out how to do it all right as you mentioned my name's uh kelsey crop and i'm the uh the owner along with my wife emily of the bison ranch llp which as you might guess is in fact a bison ranch and a custom exempt butcher shop and we are located uh, near Pingree, North Dakota, which is about 25 miles northwest of Jamestown and um, I can't speak to farmers markets. Um, we're, we're talking, I'm, I guess I was probably invited to talk about finding your niche market, which for us wasn't necessarily finding one so much as evolving into one. Uh, a little bit about our background. Um, we're a third generation family ranch. My grandfather started farming and ranching on this piece of property way back in 1924. Uh, my father farmed and ranched with him into the, well, grandpa hung it up in the late eighties. Uh, my dad uh, was a cattleman his whole life and, and small grains cattle, just like most of North Dakota. And in 1989, he purchased his first group of bison in his words, because he thought they were really cool and no other reason why. And for about two or three years, he concurrently ran bison and, and the cattle uh, separately, not within the same enclosure or anything. But it only took him a couple of years to realize that these things are pretty much take care of themselves. Uh, they were a lot easier to manage than the cattle once you have your facilities in place, we're blessed with a really nice chunk of native prairie um, where we can let them roam and they, they largely take care of themselves. In, uh, so, so in, in 1992, he sold all the cattle and went all in on the bison, uh, which was good timing because the market kind of blew up in the 90s and it, it was really, really good for a while. Uh, in 1997, he started a hunting outfitter business primarily uh, focusing on waterfall, upland game, white-tailed deer. At that time, we didn't really offer any bison because we were ranching them in the more traditional sense of cow-calf operation. We'd finish some some bulls out and deliver them to the slaughter plant in New Rockford. So we we have seen both sides of this industry. Um, and then in the early two early two thousand, some of you might know the bison industry famously. Uh, went away like they were worth nothing people were giving them away we were in a very fortunate position with with the hunting outfitter business that we already had established and a, a nice chunk of a chunk of land a, a good setting to do it we started offering bison hunts in the early 2000s and our typical clientele at that time were people just looking to shoot a bison it really wasn't about the meat in the beginning but just like a lot of bison producers in the, the ugly days, you, you did what you needed to do to, to survive. But uh, being in the hunting industry uh, previously, and like I said, having the setting and sort of getting the, our, our feet underneath us in those early days, 
as the industry started to rebound, we realized why go back to the traditional style of, of ranching when we've got a good thing going here? And we really started to focus more on, on sending our clients home with good quality eating animals. It wasn't necessarily about the horns or the head on the wall and more about offering good quality meat. So we focus on, uh, you know, 18 to 26 month old animals, usually on the younger end of that in the 20 month range. Um, in 2009, we built our own custom exempt butcher shop uh, within an old existing farm shop right here on the property. It's cozy, but it gets the job done. I, if I had a crystal ball, we'd make it about twice the size of what it is. Uh, in 2015, my wife and I moved home and, and purchased the entire operation. And since then, our focus has really been to sort of build on, on what my folks had done and focus intensively on, on meat quality and how can we get the best possible product in our client's freezer and the byproduct of that has been uh tremendous customer retention of the i think i did about 65 animals last fall and i want to say 60 to 70 percent of those were repeat customers i have uh, one of my customers has, has harvested 24 bison with us. I have a number of guys uh, since I've taken over who have, have been here every single year, one of whom is about my age and he claims he's 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 coming until he, one of us drops dead. So um, so it, it's nice to have those reliable repeat customers. Um, and so where are these people coming from? It, a little different than what we've been talking about uh, with the previous presenters. My clients are coming from all over the country. Uh, a lot of them are not necessarily even hunters. They are very simply people from all walks of life, really, uh, from your blue collar, you know, contractors, equipment operators to high profile attorneys, doctors, surgeons, you name it. But they all have one thing in common. They want all natural grass fed, lean protein for the health uh, benefit. But, you know, perhaps more important to what I'm offering on a product level is the opportunity to have the pride of ownership of that animal. They're purchasing an animal from me. They're selecting that animal. They're harvesting that animal. Um, doing it humanely which is very important not only for the meat quality particularly with bison but for for a lot of these folks they want to know that that everything was done right and that's with, with a bison which is an incredibly tough animal it's a, a bullet right here in right behind the ear canal and it's lights out it, it's all about the the abilities of the shooter and not necessarily the kick of the gun um, my, my clients want to be involved in the process where they can, but above all else, they want to know where their meat came from and people are willing to pay a premium for that. And I, I firmly believe that e even if they're not here to see it, they want to at least have the opportunity to see how that animal was raised, what it was eating, how it was harvested, how it was handled after the kill, how it was cut, how it was packaged. Um, so a question we often get that the bison industry has rebounded the last 10 years have been pretty good to pretty much everyone in the industry so why not go back to doing what it was what what we were doing before because this is a lot of work uh from mid-september to mid-december i'm either slaughtering or butchering pretty much every single day six or seven days a week so it it, it gets to be a bit of a sprint in the fall but um, we really believe in the process, the, the product uh, when it's done this way is better than virtually anything you're gonna find in a store because the, the nature of the beast, as I have written here, bison are a very excitable animal. They don't like being corralled. They don't like going on trailers and they're lean. So when you combine all of those things, you get a stress hormone in an already lean product you're gonna get a, a dried out tougher cut. I mean, there's there's no two ways about it, which a lot of the, the bison industry for those reasons wants to grain finish everything. And, and there's good reason for that. Um, so it's sort of, in my opinion, nullifies 
the benefit of bison by adding a bunch of grain fat on there at that point why not just go to beef right uh so doing the field slaughter method it it's it's yielding a a, a, a way calmer animal one second it's out there eating on the the native prairie and the next second it, it's lights out they don't even know it hit them uh, so there's no stress hormone, no adrenaline, no lactic acid in, in the meat whatsoever. Um, they're humanely killed, uh, but that that shot placement allows us to get a really nice bleed on them. I, I run up and, and slit the throat right away. Sometimes you know, a little dangerous, even though it's lights out, they, they can kick and throw their head quite a bit, even though there's no brain function. So it does get dangerous and a lot of times it gets to be a lot more exciting than either my clients or I bargain for but um, that bleed um, is, is crucial for getting all that blood out of the carcass you get such a nice clean carcass nice clean cutting table we actually timed a young bull last year from the, the throat slit to no pulse was 12 minutes so that that heart kept going for 12 minutes and got every ounce of blood out of that animal um, and all of this allows us to, we're, we're all natural, all grass fed, grass finished. We don't, we don't add any grain fat to them. And when everything's done right and everyone does their job, the client puts a good shot on them, we get a good bleed. Uh, it's, it's every bit as moist of, as the best burger you're going to find pretty much anywhere. Bison is a, a, a lean meat, so on, on the primals, if everything's done perfectly and you throw it on a grill hot and fast, it's going to get tough. But, you know, we, we, we can't take it home and cook it for them. So we try to educate all of our customers on the proper ways to, to prepare each, each cut, which is within our processing. They can stand in the butcher shop and watch us go to work. Um, we hang pretty much overnight. Um, we're really looking for that carcass just to get in the in the the green zone there in the 33 to 40 degree uh, internal temp it comes out of rigor mortis in that amount of time in the beef packing industry burger that's kind of what they're targeting as well with the primals they want to age i've experimented with aging these and ideally i'd like to go three four or five days but taking them two three weeks on on a on an animal that doesn't have a lot of uh, intermuscular tissue it's not doing a whole lot and you're you're drying you're drying out your burger to the benefit of your of your primals and the the burger is really what keeps people coming back even though the 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 pellet grill has revolutionized uh bison cooking because you can maintain that low and slow so so easily so we are sending a lot of primal cuts uh home with our clients as well now we 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 paper wrap all boneless cuts, uh, ground product in poly bags, and we we flash freeze at minus twenty, and so that product is frozen rock solid by the next morning when we load up our our clients and and send them on their way. So the whole process from the client pulling into the driveway that I'm sitting in right now uh, to loading up their meat and and out the door is. They're here for three nights, so it's it's less than three days. They come in an afternoon. We we kill the next day. We butcher the day after that, and we have them on their way and rinse and repeat on to the next one. Uh, we try to cut everything within reason to the customer's preference. Um, it, sometimes you get people asking you to grind up cuts that would make me cry. But, uh, you know, they're, they're the customer. But uh, like I said, we, we walk them through each cut and provide some recommendations. And over the years, we're starting to make uh, better chefs out of a lot of them. But it's been going well. Um, we're, we're sold out for the next two years. So the feedback has been good. The customer attention has been good. And like I said, we've, we've sort of evolved into this niche market so much as going out and finding it somewhat out of a necessity um but secondary you're you're providing somewhat of an experience but if, if the product wasn't good they wouldn't be coming back for 24 animals like my guy in michigan so that's sort of the overview if anyone has any direct questions you can email me or or, or give me a shout anytime awesome thank you um 
Uh, with that, we'll open it up to some questions. I already got some questions in the chat that I'll ask out loud, um, starting with uh, Simone. Specifically with Red River Market, what meat species types are sold at the location? Where may there be the uh, open open future op opportunities? Sorry, I worded that kind of weird. <laughs> That's okay, I got you. Um, yeah, we have a couple different beef vendors, lamb vendors, pork and chicken are all decently covered, um, but we are always looking for new vendors. Um, and you know, even if you're selling in one of those categories, uh, feel free to submit an application um, and we'll let you know um, if we have room for you. Um, we are filling up very quickly. So uh, you can go to our website, www.redriver.market um, and there's our application and our vendor guidelines on there that'll tell you everything you need to know to be a vendor. And um, even if uh, we don't have room to accept you this year, um, we'll have your information um, and can let you know when um, applications come out for the next year. Awesome, thank you. Um, our next question is for Ashley. Uh, we know that you and Wendell Livestock had the idea to grow your market. What questions did you ask to your quarter beef purchasers and customers that helped you make the jump to bigger audiences? Yeah, I'm not sure we, you know, asked specific questions by any means. It was more just through conversation with, with you know, friends, family, people in the community, just you know, people who weren't getting a quarter, half or whole, you know, why not? And well, it, it was a variety of reasons. They didn't have room for it. They didn't have budget for it, you know, different things like that. Um, and then what happened was while we were trying to figure out, you know, what Dakota Angus was, um, <clears throat> Bruner Angus had a couple extra beef. And so we had them processed and, and retail cut just to kind of test the local market. And um, like we sold out right away. I mean, it was, it was, it kind of shocked all of us, like how fast it, it happened and, and what the local response was. And so that was kind of just like the, the, yep, let's go. People want it. They, they like this option and the conversation, um, it, it, it just went. And so, um, I, I don't know that we really asked many questions. It was more so just through conversation and then we just tested it and kind of proved that, yep, yep. This is what we need to do. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, do we have any other questions? Uh, feel free to join through um, video, audio, or you can submit it through the chat function. Uh, we're pretty flexible here. Well, one question I guess I had for uh, Kelsey was, have you had any challenges uh, specifically with having to, to process bison? And um, if somebody's wanting to go down that route, what advice would you give them? I think our biggest challenge has been finding uh, reliable help. We are a seasonal business. Like I said, I'm busy from mid-September to mid-December, and there aren't uh, slaughterers and, and meat cutters growing on trees in Pingree, North Dakota, or, or even Jamestown, for that matter. So finding good help is 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 difficult. Um, be before I moved home, my dad was pretty much enlisting whatever friends he could by offering cases of beer to come over and and help when they could. Um, I looked for for somebody to sort of run the show in the butcher shop in my early days of of, of coming over and taking over the operation, and we couldn't really find much of, of anything. So. School of Hard Knocks, I learned to, to butcher myself, a lot of YouTube videos, a lot of trial and error, and I think I'm finally up to where I should be. But labor is absolutely the biggest challenge. Um, I think if someone were looking to d develop a business model that's similar to ours, I think probably the biggest challenge right now would be paying for a, a custom exempt butcher shop. I know I'm, we're very fortunate that we did this 15 years ago than, than right now with the, the cost of, of building anything. And a lot of that was elbow grease. We did it ourselves. But, um, but yeah, just um, 
licensing and equipment and you name it is yeah it, it's a whole nother ball of wax would be the, the biggest challenge uh for us uh finding the clients hasn't been a that much of a challenge because in the early days there were a lot of people offering buys and hunts when they were simply looking to get rid of them um that's sort of gone away with the the industry rebounding um so there's not a lot of competition for doing exactly what we do uh but not many people have butcher shops right on site so it's 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 a pretty unique uh a unique setup but by all means if anyone can get into it you will get clients because people are looking for this product and they're looking for it in this per very particular um condition or, or setting uh you got another question for you too uh what is the biggest reason that people want to prefer your bison product for their purchase um our our product versus whatever you're going to find in the store and keep in mind um my clients are coming from all over the country. I, I get people in North Dakota. I get people from South Dakota, Montana, you know, neighboring states that have a lot of bison where it's readily available. But a lot of my clients are coming from Florida, Texas, California, New York, um, a lot of the Midwest. And some of the, uh, you know, boutique cuts of meat on a bison are simply not available wherever they're at. And, or even something as common as a bison ribeye might not be available wherever they're at. It's a harder product to get to on, on each of the coasts. But again, um, I think the biggest differentiation is that the client knows exactly where it came from, that it's a hundred percent all natural. We don't run these things through a shoot. We don't vaccinate. We don't even wean them. They take care of themselves entirely. So we've differentiated ourselves in, in that in that way. Which and and honestly, we can fetch a premium for our product be, because of it. And that's that's why the customers keep coming back. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I had a question for Ron and Beth. Um, so I visited your guys' booth before. And if I remember correctly, you gave out sample snack sticks, correct? Uh, we did. Yeah, we did mainly because, you know, they don't need any cooking or, you know, they're, they're ready, ready to eat. And, and that's, you know, without having electricity or anything like that, or, you know, within the, I think the rules and regulations, we aren't set up to offer a cooked product, but yes, we, and that's kind of, you know, as Simone alluded to before, kind of a door opener to get people in and, you know, I've never had lamb before and starts a conversation. And, um, and usually, you know, and as I read yours, uh, you know, we did, we do give them out and, and that's a good, a good place to start with people. And then, you know, if we can get them engaged in some conversation um, and get them to come back and, and you know everybody has you know their niche whether it's grass fed or grain fed and and we are grain fed because even though i love my sheep a lot i don't want them to be here a long time and so i have a very good working relationship with the wendell family by the way ashley they have a feed processing plant and so mr wendell shows up here on a regular basis with suckers for the daycare kids so we are we are grass fed and our grain fed excuse me there are grass fed and we have customers, you know, that that's what they want. And we have customers that ask if we are grass or grain and we don't fit everybody's wants. Um, but we try to have a consistent product. And a lot of times we'll always ask, especially if they're first timers, come back and let us know what you think. Tell us what you think of our product. And I, you know, and whether they're afraid if they don't like it, they don't come back. But I guess most of the people come back and are pretty positive and want to try something else. And um, so we try to have a consistent product. And, and by that, I, we, we stay consistent with our feed program because I think feed is an influence or grain is to the flavor of the meat. And by offering a young product in our case, I think it's more of a mild flavor because yeah, an older, I'll just say an older sheep, they get a little stronger taste. And so we try to market a young young animal 
that, you know, at market weight at 150, 60 pounds that has a mild flavor, but it's, it's still different. And so, yeah, I, I think that's what it is, is consistency, Isaac. And I would, I would agree with that, but I, I do think that Ron sells himself short because I, I truly believe a lot of the relationship building that we have done over the years is because of the way this man can talk. He can carry on a conversation with people and he educates them about our product and about how we do things. And I think that has a lot to it to do with it also. I, I think that um, if you're gonna be in a farmer's market type situation, you have to be able to sell it. You have to be able to, you know, smile and talk to the crowd, ask them how their day is going, things like that. You know, if, if you just kind of stand there and wait for people to come up, you're going to be standing a long time. Or if you catch somebody's hot eye and you say, hi, how are you doing? You know, or you know, beautiful dog. People love to talk about their dogs. People love to talk about their kids. And then we just start talking about our product from there. And I think that that has a lot to do with it as well. No, uh, that, that makes perfect sense. I mean, building that communication, that's uh, one of the benefits of doing this uh, local marketing is you uh, put a name to the uh, face of uh, animal agriculture. Um, we have a question for Ashley. Uh, you said that since you are USDA inspected, it can be sold and delivered across 48 states. What have you learned on the expanded audience and online sales? Well, I'll say I'm still learning. Um, and what I mean by that is how to get it there, right? Um, our products are all frozen. And so the, the challenge being, how do I get that beef order to Washington state or Arizona or wherever it's going. Um, I, I've just learned to experiment with different packaging and um, we primarily just use ice packs and, and packaging for right now. There's a few that I'm uh, still working with trying to fine tune how, how to best do that. Luckily we started shipping during the winter months. So the pressure wasn't on too tight. Um, the summer will, will, pose a, another challenge. Um, I, I think that that shipping uh, initially was scary. Um, it took me a while to pull the trigger on that, uh, but I found a couple partners uh, that have just worked great. Um, we use speedy delivery service for the region. And I tell you what, they if if you're if you're considering shipping, Hands down, I'd recommend them. They have been great to work with. Uh, they stop here every Monday for pickup. Um, they only service, I think it's like eight, nine states, eight or nine states, um, but they've been wonderful to work with. And um, one day, two day, three day maximum shipping it's been. Um, I also picked up using FedEx. And um, once the biggest challenge there was how to do it economically, right? Um, because I don't want to, I don't want to make our customers pay $150 to ship them for steaks. Um, and I, I'm also not going to increase the cost of my, or the price of my steaks to make up for the price of shipping. I feel like some of those bigger name brand um, beef companies that, or meat companies that do that, you're paying, you know, $200 for four steaks. Well, that's because of the cost of shipping. They say it's free shipping, um, but that's built into the cost of their, their product. And so I'm not going to have two different prices for my beef products, one for those that get shipped and then offer free shipping. So there's kind of a balance. But once I became a, a partner with the, the two shipping companies, I was actually had access to better shipping rates. And so if you haven't looked into it, but you're interested, definitely do because it's worth it. Um, and And yeah, I mean, it's been really good. I can't say we've done a ton of shipping, but it's been enough and our customers have appreciated it and it's been fun, fun learning. Um, and, and so it's, it, it's just an, it's an added, it's an added bonus for, our, for us. You know, there's, we've been asked a lot, can you ship? And I know there's a lot that just say no, but we thought it was valuable enough to be able to, you know, reach our customers across the country. And, and so we're able to do that. So, so far, it's been a good experience. Awesome. Thank you. 
Um, is there any final questions from the audience? Well, seeing none, I, I guess uh, we'll wrap it up for the evening. Um, it's been a joy having all four of our panelists tonight. Um, and I'll let you guys go through and say some final comments and thoughts that you might have. Uh, we'll start with Simone. Yeah, um, if you ever have any questions or um, you know want to reach out about what it's like to be a, a vendor at the market, feel free to shoot us a message on our website. All right, uh, we'll move on to Ron and Beth. Well, one thing, you know, I'll say in niche market or whatever, it's opened a couple of doors that we didn't expect just because of the traffic flow and the, the proximity of where we're at. Uh, I think we mentioned either this time or the last time that we do sell product to a couple of restaurants in Fargo. It was mainly because of the contact of the owners walking through and um, seeing our product and wanting to try locally and, and has built some relationships, you know, that that is very handy to us and, and you know, open doors and conversations and, and one led to another. And, and we do have restaurants that, you know, that because of the location of it, that come by and, and we've offered and sold some product to them. Our, our biggest challenge is, which the, our other guests probably offer is they have product year round. Uh, and we can't provide that on a large scale and, and really don't want to because uh, like Beth said, we have other things going on in our lives called full-time jobs and, and whatnot. But this does give us an opportunity to get our product out to a lot of people. And so explore that. Don't be afraid to try different things. The shipping scares the H out of me. <laughs> people always ask and, and that the challenge is yeah, economically and whatnot, how do you do it? And you might get a phone call from us one day because it sounds like you got it figured out. <laughs> awesome. Uh, we'll move on to Kelsey. Yeah, just uh, it's been mentioned a couple of times in here. If, you, if you're starting a new venture, be very consistent with your message and your 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 image. Um, having a having a good logo, color scheme. Um, and a, a, just a steady message. I try not doing too much. I try to stay in my lane. I try to do one thing and my hope is to do it better than anyone else. And, and if you kind of stick to that mantra, as, as I always tell my wife, I, I try not to half-ass a whole bunch of things. I try to whole ass one thing. And I think that's, that's a good mantra to live by. Awesome. That sounds like great advice to me. Um, and finally, uh, get some final comments from Ashley. Yeah, I like everything that everybody shared so far. I guess I would just say don't be don't be afraid to try something. I mean, we've hit a lot of bumps and hiccups and and have learned a ton um, in the time that we've been doing what we're doing. But we're also a group of people that aren't afraid to try new things and and have big ideas. Um, don't be afraid of pursuing the big idea. It, it might work. It might not, but it might. And if it does, then, then awesome, you know, um, set, set goals and shoot for them. And you just never know what you're going to find along the way. Awesome. Thank you. Um, that concludes our webinar for the evening. Uh, we will, uh, join us next week for the webinar over ret retail inventory management. Uh, we have a good group of guests again next week, and we look forward to everybody joining us. Mm -hmm.